Steve, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'm glad you talked about how much the stock's gone up. Uh, that's great. Right. You, you uh, thought I was going to stop there, but I actually... That's okay. I, I read what, a little more about what it. What I'm so really that. happy about is that you didn't translate that into, you know, that's $3.25. <laughs> It's all about percentages, so that's, Absolutely. that's what I was focusing on. Um, so I want to start talking a little bit about some of the stuff that's most in the news, and then I'd like to kind of flip back a little bit more towards your career history. So, you know, and then I'll come back to some of the business stuff. So I'm not going to let you off the hook. I'm just going to start with a few things just to make sure we get them in. Okay. But so my first, okay. Take, take your okay. time. That's all okay, right. Okay, good. Go ahead. Just to give you a, a road map so you know what's coming. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, my first question is, is Citi a good investment? Should people out here buy stock in it, or do we already own enough? Well, uh, I have two responses to that. Anything that's good for the government should be good for all of us. And the secondly, whether you know it or not, you own it <laughs> as well. But seriously, at four something a share, do, I mean, do, are you recommending the stock? Is the stock that's going to go up? Well, you, I always, I mean, how, yeah. how can a CEO of a company not talk and like his stock? But let me say a little thing about, a little bit about where we are. Um, obviously, uh, we've gone through a lot of uh, painful reorganizations, recapitalization decisions, all of which were extremely difficult, but we had to do them. But the result of all of that is we are in an extremely strong financial position today as a company. We have a very clear strategy for where the company is going forward, and we have a very, very good management team that's executing extremely well. That's all the fundamental side of the equation. The other side of that is that we're trading at about something like one times book value per share. A lot of the other banks are trading at a multiple. They're trading at 1.6, 1.8 times book value. Some of that is because of the fact that the government owns a large position and uh, they may sell it in the market or God knows exactly what people perceive is going to happen with that particular position. But certainly if you look at the valuation of where we are versus some of the other companies, we kind of feel that, uh, that there's an upside. Mm -hmm. Um, I will definitely get back to that in quite a bit more depth. I, I wanted to ask you about Sheila Bear. Uh, isn't that kind of a bad enemy to have, head of the FDIC? And, Keep going. Yeah, no, that's the question. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to comment on um, any particular regulator. What I can say to you is that um, we're now all aligned with all our regulators. Um, we have a very constructive relationship with them. They like the strategy we're on. They like what they're seeing in terms of how well we're executing. Mm -hmm. uh, it does turn out that the government, which is the U.S. Treasury, plus the FDIC, they are owners of our stock. And for that matter, for us and everybody else in the business, mm -hmm. they're owners of our bonds, too. And so they want us to succeed. Uh, and we feel like we are all uh, exactly in the same place right now. We're very mm -hmm. well aligned. And uh, all they want us to do is just keep executing, keep mm -hmm. doing what we're doing. That's but a good I'm, place to be. But I mean, seriously, doesn't it put kind of undue pressure on you to know that there's a lot of public comment about this particular regulator having issues with, with your management team specifically? Again, I'm not going to comment on any particular regulator. What I said is uh, still exactly the case, which mm -hmm. is that we're all at this point very much aligned with mm -hmm. what's right for mm -hmm. city, what's right for our stockholders, what's right for our bondholders, which is that we need to just keep on executing on what we're doing. And I think as long as we keep doing that and as long as we turn the company to sustain profitability, um, uh, all the noise mm -hmm. will disappear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, give us a little color on what it's like to have the government owning 34 percent of your company. To what extent are they involved in day-to-day -day management? Are they in your board meetings, are they in your committee meetings, just what's the relationship and how, how detailed is it? They're not in our board meetings, they're not in our committee meetings, uh, they're not involved in day-to-day -day management. Um, it is something that's a new experience for them and just mm -hmm. like it's a new experience for us. Nobody planned to be where we are. It's a little bit of an experiment for everybody. Uh, but what uh, is great about where we are, again, is through this process of really not having done this before. The government mm -hmm. hasn't, we haven't, and really there's no game book on this. Uh, we keep coming back to what's the right answer. Why did they put money into city, and what 
did it accomplish what was it supposed to accomplish you keep coming back to they want us to be successful they want us to be stable they want us to grow they want us to be profitable they want mm -hmm. to serve want us to serve our clients very well we're very very aligned on that mm -hmm. and uh, you know that's very powerful um, not only are we aligned but they like again the strategy we're on they like right. and uh, what we're doing and uh, I'm back again to the same point. All we need to do is just keep executing the way we are as a team, as a company, and, uh, and we'll be able to show everybody um, the strength of the franchise. Uh, and, and I do want to come, come back and talk about the strategy. Uh, a little more about what the day-to-day -day is like, though, w sure. with the government, because it is unusual. I think people are wondering wh what role actually are they playing, uh, at what level of strategic decision or tactical decision are they participating in and just accepting for the moment that they're happy with what you're doing, what, what actual role are they playing day to day? Again, I'm very candid. I mean, uh, I know that there may be a perception that there's something more meaningful here as part of the stake that they own, mm -hmm. uh, but outside of all the regular conversations we and other regulated institutions have with their regulators. And, mm -hmm. You know, as banks, we have substantial dialogue with our mm -hmm. regulators constantly. Outside of those kind of conversations that we're having, I'm sure every other bank, every other regula regulated institution is having, um, we are responsible for the company. We're responsible mm -hmm. for managing it. We're responsible for managing it day to day. We've mm -hmm. been responsible for putting forth the strategy. And that shouldn't be surprising because the president's been very clear. He has no interest in running banks. Uh, the Treasury Department, the Treasury Secretary has been very clear. He's got no interest in running banks. The chairman of the Fed's been very clear. He's got no interest in operating and running banks. And, uh, and they mean it. Yeah. Okay. Um, there, there's been some coverage this week about your goal or desire to decrease the government's stake partly by issuing a, additional stock, partly um, by the government at the same time selling some of theirs. Can you give us a little more detail about that and what you're thinking and why? Again, there's a lot of news stories. That's right. Let's just step back a little bit. We mm -hmm. got from the government um, $45 billion of help in the form of equity, $25 billion of which is in the form of common stock, right. another 20 in the form of a preferred stock. The $25 billion of common stock um, is now probably worth 34, 35 billion dollars. The stock's gone up. Right. They got the stock at three and a quarter dollars a sh share. We're I think 440, 450, something of that sort in the market. Uh, and it's free. It's tradable. It's, it can be sold at their discretion. Um, and I can't really comment on what their goals are. Mm -hmm. But again, um, uh, it is a position they hold at a profit. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't be surprised if there is somebody thinking about whether or not they ought to see if they want to monetize some mm -hmm. of that. That's, mm -hmm. again, but their decision. The $20 billion on the TARP, uh, which is the preferred stock, is our decision. Right. That's a decision we're going to have to make over time. Um, and uh, to me, as I've been clear, um, that's less about the capacity for us to repay that more about timing, uh, particularly given what we've gone through. We've had to overshoot the other way on capital to create more confidence with greater strength than one would normally right. need. And particularly what we've gone through, I'd like to see a little bit more stability in the economy. I like what I'm seeing. Um, there seems to be moderation out there in terms of consumer losses. There's some stability emerging, but it's too early. And I'd really like to be a little bit more confident before we decide it's time to pay it back. And when we decide it's time to pay it back, we'll go talk to them. We'll talk to the regulators and devise exactly how we do that, but, um, but all in good time. One of the big issues that the banks have been facing after getting the TARP money was right. the notion that they're supposed to get the money and they're supposed to use it at least in the public view, they were supposed to use it to start lending, get the credit markets moving, uh, making sure businesses could start uh, uh, building through, uh, uh, through borrowing. And a lot of questions have been raised, including at some times, I think, by the president as to whether there, that commitment was really, really being fulfilled. Uh, what, what has Citi done? What does Citi intend to do? Mm -hmm. We actually um, have taken the commitment extremely seriously. Uh, we've got, as I said, $45 billion of government money. Uh, we set up, as soon as we got the money, we set up a group that was responsible for making sure 
They looked at where to put that money to work towards um, which kind of needs, um, consumers, mortgages, small businesses, and we've been steadily putting the money out. And not only have we been doing that, but we've been very transparent. We want everybody to see what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. And so we have uh, this on our website. Go to our website, click on it, and you'll see exactly where we put our money to work. Uh, and as of last count, we've not only used up all the TARP money we've gotten, but uh, we've gone beyond that into, in terms of what we think is incremental lending versus what we would have normally done in our business. So that part's working. Um, and again, I haven't looked at all my uh, competitors or colleagues on the street who also got uh, mm -hmm. TARP money, but by and large, um, the banks have been trying to do exactly what the administration would like to see done, exactly what we think is right, which is when it's prudent, when you see a need, you need to be out there. You need to lend money and you need to make sure that you are providing the liquidity that the marketplace and businesses need to, need to grow. If there is a view or a feeling that there's not enough credit out there, where it's really coming from is not so much the banking system or the banks, but where it's coming from is something called the shadow banking system. And I know it's, it's a little difficult for everybody to understand what the banking system is versus what the shadow banking system was, but the, there was an entire industry that grew over the last five, seven years of finance companies and securitization companies and other plays where these companies borrowed money from bond markets, took that money and turned around and created loans out of it and tried to earn a spread on where they borrowed the money in the bond market versus where they lent it out. It's these kind of companies, these activities that have been most impacted. Why? Because they're unable to raise that money from bond markets. Because many of them have had some issues, many people have lost money, and it's very hard for them to finance themselves. That's where, if you see a decrease in credit or decline, that's where you're seeing a substantial reduction in the amount of credit availability in the market. Very different from the banks, who are actually doing a pretty good job, and I'm not saying they aren't being prudent, but the level of difference is stark between the banking system and the shadow banking system. Yeah. Well, we did a cover story a, a few weeks ago uh, where we talked to President Obama about one of the things we talked about was the financial industry. And he really you know, said that he felt as if the industry was reverting to risky practices. It wasn't really stepping up as much as it should have been. He really seemed quite annoyed about it. And then, of course, on Monday, he gave a speech on Wall Street, where he also seemed to be chiding the industry, uh, both for not supporting uh, financial regulation that he thinks is needed, and I think also for not kind of participating as much as they should in the solution. It, it wasn't very well received on Wall Street. I was wondering what your view was of his speech. I can't speak for Wall Street. I can't speak for the other firms. Let me speak for Citi. Um, I think the regulatory approach and the regulatory plan the administration is thinking about, for that matter, the G20, uh, that plan is based on exactly the right principles. We need capital standards that are uh, not pro-cyclical. We need level playing fields around the world, uh, measures for liquidity, capital. Uh, we need to make sure that you don't have a banking system that's regulated and a shadow banking system that's completely unregulated, doing the same business that the banking system does. So you need to cast a wide net and pick up uh, institutions uh, and really have a very, very large part of the financial services business get regulated. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, market structure, creating more transparency, all those things are good. So we actually are very much a fan of the principles that have been set forth by the Treasury on where they'd like to see regulation. Frankly, those are the same principles that most of the G20 are talking about because this is a G20 game. It's not about the U.S., it's about how the world mm -hmm. all agrees to the same principles uh, because, again, money flows everywhere around the world and, uh, and you need to make sure that everybody has the same standards. Mm -hmm. uh, there is going to be a change on Wall Street. There is. There is change at city. If you look at our business model, our business model has gone from what used to be a, a very balance sheet heavy, very... Uh, risk-oriented approach to very much a client business. We have turned the company, uh, and obviously we still have some work to do because not everything we need to do in terms of disposing assets uh, is, has all been done, but we've turned the company from a product-oriented, um, uh, wholesale funding, balance sheet intensive, risk uh, 
lending-oriented company to a client-facing what's right for clients business, which is about market-making, client facilitation, loans, services, mm -hmm. things of that sort. That's a substantial shift. Mm -hmm. In our own case, uh, we're going to be 40% smaller in our balance sheet right. versus where we were uh, when all this got started. Now, that's a substantial shift. You know, people talk about how banks are not reducing their size. Well, in our case, we are reducing what we're doing, and we are very much focused on making sure that we kind of go back to the principles, the old principles of the old partnership structures on mm -hmm. Wall Street. Probably the, the last time in some way, I know, and I know it wasn't perfect by any means, the partnership structures weren't perfect, but that's probably the last mm -hmm. time compensation structures sort of were designed in a way where you really had skin in the game, and you really, um, you know, we're on the hook, and so we're doing everything we can at our company to think about how do you replicate that. Now, you know, it's very hard as a large company. You can't go back to that format, but you certainly can. You certainly can think about long-term compensation structures with clawbacks and things of that sort. So, you know, whether it's based on reducing size, reducing our approach from risk-taking to client facilitation to changing our compensation structures. Um, we're there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think when you look around the world and really focus a little bit away from Wall Street and go around the G20 companies, mm -hmm. I know that's happening in the UK. Yeah. I know that's where the French are. I know that's where the Germans are. And I know that's where the uh, Chinese and Indians have always been. So um, again, uh, we kind of understand exactly what happened with us right. in a very painful way, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and we also understand what really drives a good business and financial services. That's where we're going. Just on the regulatory, just so I don't miss anything, Consumer Protection Agency, mm -hmm. you're okay with that? Uh, I am okay with that now, uh, but I don't know what it is. Yeah, um, the concept is good. I understand mm -hmm. that. You know, last time something like this happened was during the Great Depression. And what came out of that? The SEC came out of that. Now, what was that all about? That was about investor protection. You need an investor protection agency. Well, this go around through all of this, it's about protect the consumer on the mortgages they have, on the loans they have, on the credit cards they have. I, you know, in general, uh, making sure that banks and other financial services companies are doing right by their clients is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but at the, at the, on the other hand, uh, you want to make sure that as you think about uh, what's right for customers, it's in the context of the fact that uh, these entities are also running a business. Now, how you balance the yin and the yang between customer protection mm -hmm and the fact that these are businesses shouldn't get in the way of protecting customers, but it is an important detail to work out as to what the mandate of the Consumer Protection Agency is. Right. Um, and, uh, and I'd like to see more about that. Okay. And the philosophy sounds so, great. The so concept sounds great. Theory, you're for it, but you may run into trouble on the details, depending on what they are. But isn't that the case about yeah. everything in life, okay. right? <laughs> uh, well, well, just one other regulatory question. Right. Uh, we have a piece this week and I'm doing a little extra brand promotion tonight, but uh, we have a Are piece. Are talking about City? Uh, no, <laughs> Business Week. Um, we have a piece this week uh, by Jeffrey Garden um, uh, proposing a, uh, a, a, a global um, a, a bank, um, a, um, you know, a glo global regulator. Global, regu global regulator uh -huh. and uh, global central bank, essentially. Right. Uh, what's your thinking about that? Well, again, the, it's, it's all about the details, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but let's, let's stick with the U.S. for a second, okay? Um, we got to make sure that we're doing things correctly, too. But in, isn't everything in interconnected? I mean, one of the people, things people are talking about yes. is how do you have U.S. regulation, go, and you have some extraordinarily global business yes. uh, governing a global business. Mm -hmm. Well, it isn't uh, the U.S. Regula regulation that governs the business. Take a look at our example. Uh, we have businesses in 109 countries around the world, which means we have 109 regulators, um, mm. sometimes two, three per country. But right. it's, a, it's a big group. Um, and what you do is that you abide by the local regulation, the local laws. You do that everywhere, and that's sort of the beginning. But that doesn't actually get at systemic issues. And that's where the Fed comes in. Mm. And so uh, the Fed is our primary regulator, and their role is to make sure that we're running a good company, a systemically sound company, 
but that doesn't necessarily preclude the other regulators from having a say in terms of what we do in that particular country. That's how it works. The other thing that is working extremely well mm -hmm. is that the Fed and the Bank of England and the Central Bank of China, for that matter, the Bundesbank, they're all talking. And we've never seen coordination as good as we've seen through this crisis. Mm -hmm. And that's clearly true on the central bank level, so much so that, um, that the facilities that were put in place, the tools that were put in place to handle the liquidity crisis were really done in conjunction of, uh, with, the, with the Fed talking to the ECB, talking to the Bank of right. China, and working on it in a very, very substantially fast way. Um, practically speaking, I don't know if you you know, I mean, you tell me, practically speaking, how you're going to sign up, in our case, 109 countries in the world, whatever 300 plus countries there are, um, all to agree to one global regulator. So um, I'm not so sure you need that as much mm -hmm. as you need what we talked about earlier, which is a level playing field, same types of rules, same mm -hmm. types of capital requirements, same types of liquidity, same types of accounting. If you have those global standards, then you can have different regulators in different countries, mm -hmm. but with those standards, you have a lot of commonality in terms of how they approach banks and how they approach the system. Okay, just a couple more questions before we get to the this is your life part of the conversation. No, no, um, keep going on this. No, no, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> I gather you don't love talking about that personal stuff, but um, I, I wanted to ask you about the, the whole issue of bonuses and, and executive compensation kind of in this early part of the conversation. Uh, there's a dispute about, uh, you know, $100 million uh, in, in, in compensation to uh, uh, the bonus to Andrew Hall, a, a trader. Uh, there's a lot of uh, concern about uh, how much money bankers make. Uh, you've kind of been on the record saying you have to find a way for people to be compensated appropriately so you get the best people. But at the same time, there's enormous public concern uh, about uh, how much money people are making. I mean, do bankers make too much money, and how should we be thinking about uh, compensation and bonuses? Again, uh, I want to go back to what I said before, which is that the last time I believe that you actually had complete alignment and interest between people who are uh, part of the company but also stock owners was when you had these partnerships and all that. And then, you know, they all grew in size and they went public, et cetera, all those kind of things. Um, and so the principal issue of compensation to me in an organization is you want a structure mm -hmm. and you want a concept that drives them to take the right kind of risk, the right mm -hmm. kind of prudent risk, uh, behave correctly. Uh, there are compensation structures, if you design them, that actually create what's called moral hazard, mm -hmm. which is the heads I win, tails you lose, and that drives you to take uh, excessive risk. Um, and so the art of compensation structures is really about driving the right behavior, particularly in risk taking, per se. Um, it's not easy, but we're well on the way to doing that. Uh, and that, to me, is the bigger question. The question is, what's the right structure? Uh, the question is, how do you make sure that up and down the organization, they're aligned with what the goals are of the shareholders, what the goals are of the stakeholders, including the bondholders? If you get that right, then uh, you've got to create an environment, an atmosphere, where uh, meritocracy is valued. Because ultimately, in our business, I'm sure it's true in every business, but particularly in our business, talent is my single most important asset. And I want to create an environment and a place where they are recognized for their performance, where they're paid for their performance, where they operate within the right culture, where they're paid competitively. Um, all of that, um, and so if you get the structure right, and if you get the culture right, um, that makes for a successful company. But isn't that what the goal of business is all about? And that's, I think, where we need to have, uh, where we need to go. Since you do have consumer businesses, and there's tremendous public anxiety on this issue, and of course you're heavily owned by the taxpayers now, isn't there just uh, even if you're doing that kind of alignment, isn't, aren't there some sums that are just too much? For example, take $100 million. Is that just too much for somebody to make? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. 
but nonetheless, if you have a contractual commitment, that creates a different issue for you. Well, I'm not going to talk about yeah. anybody specific or any particular business. Um, in that, let me step back. In that particular case, um, that is one of the legacy businesses. Actually, it's been a very profitable business. Um, Fibro actually goes back a number of years, mm -hmm. um, and this is something which uh, has been part of the old Solomon Brothers before Solomon Brothers became a part of City. So this is this is there's a long history of this, and we have been in the process. Of, of transferring that from what it was, which is a proprietary trading business to an mm -hmm. asset management business on its own, on the side. And you know what we're really gonna do pretty soon is restructure or rationalize that business and move it on to mm -hmm. the plans we had in the first place. But leaving that aside, um, again, um, uh, absolutely, I think the, but I wanna go back again to the basic principle, and the basic principle is you wanna have the right structure in place. You want to have the right incentives, and then I think it's a good thing to reward people for performance within the umbrella of a structure that creates the right kind of behavior, the right kind of risk taking. You want to have people make sure that they believe they can get paid for what they do correctly. Um, the, the last thing I want to ask uh, on this, this portion is just for, to get a little bit more of your feeling about where the industry is heading and where mm -hmm. the economy is heading, mm -hmm. both for the rest of this year and kind of maybe a, a year into the future. Um, Bernanke suggested we're, we're done with the recession. What, what kind of recovery are we looking at? And, um, you know, kind of what's your prediction of where we're heading? Yeah. Now, you know, really to understand what's going on, you really have to disaggregate the world in some ways. And so, um, you look at Latin America below Mexico, there's something real going on there. Um, consumer demand's working, the economies are doing well. We kind of feel that those economies have bottomed and probably are on their way up and sustainably on their way up. The same thing is true in India, the same thing is true in certain Southeast Asian countries. Uh, China, uh, you know, has been an export-driven economy. It's doing well because of a lot of government spending. Um, and as we look at where that economy is going, uh, it feels to us the government's going to do almost anything it can mm -hmm. to ensure that they mm -hmm. have a good growth rate. So they're going to do well. Uh, Russia is benefiting from the fact that China is doing well and therefore it needs commodities and oil prices are high, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I guess the picture I'm trying to paint is that there's something going on in the emerging markets as a block that suggests a good recovery, maybe even a sustained recovery. That leaves us with U.S. and Europe. Let's talk about the U.S. Uh, again, we like what we're seeing out there, stability. We like what we're seeing in terms of inventory restocking. Some businesses, some manufacturing companies are hiring people back, et cetera. All of that's mm -hmm. true. But we've got to appreciate that this recovery is happening against the backdrop of some of the worst imbalances in economic history. Mm -hmm. And the imbalances are the consumer not saving. And the consumer has to start saving. They are. And so they're not going to run back and consume. As a matter of fact, we hope they don't. Mm -hmm. We hope they save in a sustainable way. It's good for them. It's good for the country. Mm -hmm. uh, it happened against uh, uh, you know, the backdrop of a housing price decline, which uh, resulted from too much housing versus what the true demand was. And that's a huge imbalance. That's going to have to work its way out. And we're getting there. But we're not fully th through all of this. And so. While we have stabilized and while it feels like some cycles are starting to emerge, the basic structural imbalance issues are so strong that the chairman is probably right that it's not going to feel like a recovery for a while mm -hmm. because we're going to have to work out of these imbalances, which calls for a much slower growth environment for a sustained period of time in this country. Now, you know, uh, there are all kinds of things that can happen between now and, and when it feels like it's a true recovery. You know, we are all living on stimulus. We're all living on a lot of money supply being printed by the Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world. It's very hard at this stage to discern between what is really a recovery versus what's really being primed by all these yeah. programs. And that's typically where we are exactly at this stage of the game. Right. 
Um, and you're not going to be able to know. You can't predict today. You're going to have to wait for another two, three, four quarters to know exactly whether it was the priming or whether right. it was actually a true recovery starting. Uh -huh. That's still the uncertainty ahead of us. But uh -huh. by and large, um, you know, I'd be more constructive than not on yeah. where we're going GDP as a U.S. economy. GDP growth in 2010, what would you say it's going to be? Uh, I, I, I can't tell you two, what the two GDP percent. growth is going to be. I know um, uh, that I would be happy. With two, if I could print 2%, I'd take it today mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and some of that depends, Steve, on the fact that we've had such a sharp correction on the way down yeah. that sometimes you get a snapback. Yeah. And sometimes that snack back is pretty severe, but then once you get the snap back, it probably sort of plateaus, plateaus out for a while. Yeah. So I'm less interested in whether it's 1%, 2%, 3% with the number is. I'm more interested in what's the shape of the recovery. How does it work? Does it snap back and then stay flat, or is it a steady growth? Those are the kind of things we're watching, but it's really too early. Yeah. All we can say is we like what we see, right. and uh -huh. you shouldn't be able to say any more than that, because right. at this stage of a recovery, you can't tell. Yeah. Uh, overall, unemployment uh, likely to those stay pretty high for a while. Because of these imbalances, and don't forget, by the way, I don't know what the exact numbers are, approximately half of the U.S. economy is real, was real estate driven, right. right from Home Depot to the builders to, uh, you know, the plumbers to the mortgage companies to finance companies to banks. I mean, if you really look at where uh, and what drives the U.S. economy, about half of it is, you, is, is real estate. And when you think about that and you say, okay, real estate is going to be one of those industries broadly speaking, where you don't need the capacity you had before. Well, if you believe that, then you need to make sure that capacity is utilized somewhere else. And so mm -hmm. uh, we have a structural issue for a period of time that may keep unemployment at elevated levels. Okay. Okay. We're, we're going to go way back to India now. <laughs> Leaping back to India. Um, you grew up in India. Tell me a little bit about where that was, uh, what kind of uh, you know, home you grew up in, what your, your parents did for a living, just get, where were you, what, did, what, what was life like growing up before you came here? Uh, well, let's see. Um, I actually, actually had a good, good, good childhood. It really was um, part of a wonderful family, very supportive. Um, what, did, what did your father do for a living? Uh, he worked or for a husband? pharmaceutical company in India, um, and um, uh, I actually grew up in a variety of different cities uh, in India before coming to school here, uh, which, which um, is really interesting because I went from India to Colombia, sort of going from India to Harlem in some ways, right? It's a big, it's a big leap. At that time, I couldn't tell the difference. But uh, today, obviously, uh, things are a little bit different on did, both sides. Did, did I, I shouldn't you, did, have said that. Did, I don't think so. But um, Did you come here alone, or did you uh, come here with your family? Uh, I did have family making sure that I came here correctly. I was in college and all of that right. stuff. But, but you I, came I, here I'm, to go to college, I basically. Did, I did come yeah. here okay. uh, to go to college, and then, um, then you know, but that's when I was 16. I came here when I was 16. I went to Columbia, and I've been here ever since then. And uh, that's the bigger part of my memory. Don't you want to talk uh -huh. about that? Well, we'll get there, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, I mean, I just I find it interesting to take somebody who's become CEO of City, and you're growing up in India just yeah. wondering, you know, what did you think you were going to do with your life? What did you think you were going to do when you grew up? Uh, you know, yeah. what, what were you interested in as a kid? Yeah. You know, I have a 16-year-old son, and if I ask him that, he can't tell me now, <laughs> right, what exactly the answers to those questions I, are. I, I can uh, see why I've not found anything in writing about this, because yeah, so, you, you so, clearly are not. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> I think this requires good. more exploration. It, but, it, it, uh, it, it, it may, but uh, let's talk about the economy. All right, you want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let, let, I just want to, we'll, we'll leave... Uh, India, since you don't seem to want to go there. Um, you majored in electrical engineering. I did. Um, so it was not a, initially a finance background. Sure. So wh why did you do that, and how did yeah. you make the switch in your thinking about what you yeah. wanted to do? Well, every, every, every good son in India either grew up to be a doctor or an engineer. And between yeah. the two, engineering seemed like a better thing at that point. So that's, that's, uh -huh. uh, that's literally what happened. Um, and actually, I enjoyed it. I, I, um, I liked the... Uh, the rigor and the logical aspects of engineering, but pretty soon when I got in and uh, I did okay, and, but it became very clear, you know, I was no good at it. Really? It's very clear. Really? I was uh -huh. not going to be any good at it. I mean, there were people who were really sharp, understood this stuff better, and all of that, and um, somewhere along 
um, my uh, undergraduate years at Columbia, um, I, guess, I guess one of the most interesting things about Columbia mm -hmm. is whether you go there to become an engineer or, or, or a physicist or economist, doesn't matter what you do, you have to take certain courses. Right. It's called the core curriculum, which uh, takes you all the way back to Plato, Aristotle, all the way through um, everything else and other things. Etc., cetera, which, uh, which I took under great protest, but I had no choice mm. but to do all of that back then. Through that, I actually uh, took an economics class. I said, well, this is really huh. interesting. This is really interesting. And what I'd like to do is figure out how I can take what I learned, which was very logical, very mathematical, all of that, and start thinking about economics in that way. Um, and it's a wonderful university. I was talking to people professors and all of that and became very clear that economics was the right way to go mm -hmm. um, for me and that's really what I did. I ultimately got a PhD in, uh, in business economics mm -hmm. from Columbia, mm -hmm. uh, but that's, that was a transition. And you went into teaching after that, right? You went to Indiana University or did you do something in between? No. Uh, while I was getting a, t a PhD, um, you know, I did teach mm -hmm. and I taught at Columbia. And while I was still getting a PhD, I also took a year, year and a half to go teach at Indiana. Mm -hmm. But that was all through the course of finishing up my PhD. Uh -huh. Don't forget, you got to pay for it somehow, right? right. So this was yeah. uh, my way of doing it. Uh -huh. And so what was your first private sector job when you, when you got out? Well, you know, uh, what happened was while I was teaching um, at Columbia, um, uh, there were partners at Morgan Stanley who had connections with some of the professors at mm -hmm. Columbia and um, they at that point thought there were a couple of their people who actually needed to get educated in the new modes of corporate finance and so they called up uh, somebody at Columbia and said, who do you have? And mm -hmm. said, why don't you use this guy, you know, he's pretty good. And so um, I got going with that, I, I actually um, you know, spent the summer teaching, I think, one or two occasionally people down at Morgan Stanley what the new age corporate finance was all about, how you think about companies, capital structure, how you think mm -hmm. about the capital markets, all of that. Um, and, you know, that's really where the process started and one thing got to the other and just like, you know, I looked at engineering and then economics was more interesting. I looked at kind of, okay, maybe I can get my PhD and go teach and do research or I can do this, and this yeah. was more appealing, and yeah. that's what happened. Uh -huh. um, so you spent a lot of years at Morgan Stanley. You moved, I did. You moved up through the system. You were extremely yes. successful there. Mm -hmm. um, you were considered by many people to be a likely heir apparent to, to take over, and then there was a, a power struggle or a, a series of disputes in the company, as I understand it, uh, that involved the CEO at the time, uh, Phil Purcell, and in that process, um, at least from what I've read, uh, you, you know, you were perceived as, as the opposition, you got ousted, and, um, you know, and, and we're no longer there. Uh, did, did you have any reflections on what, what you learned from that experience, both about kind of organizational issues, office politics, uh, just kind of what, what, did, what did you come away with after that experience of leaving Morgan Stanley? Or are you going to disagree with my whole description of it? Well, I'm not going to agree with it, but what I can say... Uh, <laughs> is that I really enjoyed my time at Morgan Stanley. It was fabulous, it was great. Um, and, uh, and I learned a lot, and this was back in the days when, uh, uh, when things like futures were just being introduced, corporate mm -hmm. finance was coming at its own age, all of that, I learned a lot over time. Uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I, all the way through, even the last days, really, really enjoyed it very much. But uh, you come to a point where uh, you've done a lot, you've accomplished a lot, and uh, it's really a question of, okay, what next? Where are we going next, et cetera? And a lot of that had to do with the strategic direction of the business. And, uh, and as I looked at kind of where things were going, and as, uh, as the board and the other management there looked at where things were going, it became pretty clear it would be better for all of us if I was not there. And that was really the transition from there on. And frankly, um, uh, it, it wasn't an easy decision for me. Uh, certainly, I don't think it was an easy decision for the company as well. But um, uh, I've enjoyed everything I've done since then. And uh, um, yeah, I'm just thankful for uh, having a great platform where, where I learned a lot and actually learned a lot of the skills that are coming in handy today. Okay, very diplomatic. Uh, 
let, 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 since time is short, let's leap ahead back to city. Uh, you became CEO only 10 months after you've gotten there. You got to city because uh, you had started a, a hedge fund of Old Lane Partners. City bought it. You went, you went to city, and 10 months later, you were you were CEO, uh, replacing Chuck Prince. I mean, was that a trajectory that you thought was even possible when you got there? Was or was that much more sudden than you'd expected? Uh, there was nothing expected about that trajectory. Right. Let's be right. very clear. As a matter of fact, I was there, and I got there because we thought the business we were building mm -hmm. uh, would be enormously enhanced by the distribution capabilities, the capital capabilities, and uh, the people and the resources that City had. And we thought we could take what we had together with what City had in this area, which was alternative investments, and put it all together and create a you know really a good-sized business, very interesting. And that's what we were looking forward to doing. Uh, and that's really why I got there. And that's really why the team that came with me, part of Old Lane, was part of City as well. And the things did progress from there on. Uh, as you said, 10 months later, I had a different job. Uh, the um, Chuck Prince, of, of course, was your predecessor, and in the years, particularly since, uh, Sandy Weil, who was kind of the architect of the financial supermarket that City had become, has been very critical of Chuck Prince's tenure and, and basically said one thing he was really, Chuck, what Sandy said, one thing he was really bad at was CEO of succession. I, I mean, do, do, do you have any comment on how City had been managed prior to the time you were there? You know, you, I, I think you've got to go back, um, and whether you look at John Reed or whether you look at Sandy Weil or whether you look at Chuck Prince, um, each of them actually made significant contributions in their own way. All along the way, John Reed, because he actually really started building the consumer business for City at Sandy because he brought investment banking in there, um, you know, equity trading in there, also was really the architect with a couple of the people of buying Banamex and Han Lowy, some of our biggest emerging market uh, consumer banks, per se. And, um, and Chuck, Chuck did a great job in trying to turn the company from a collection of acquisitions, which is what it was by then, into an operating company, a integrated company, right culture, right approach, et cetera. So each of them made significant contributions where we as a company went wrong is that we probably overstayed some businesses for too long, we probably overstayed some people for too long, and we probably acquired too many assets at the top of the market. Um, and, uh, you know, when I got in there, what I found was uh, a lot of consumer-oriented assets with the market turning, and you see exactly what's happened to the U.S. consumer, found businesses that perhaps would be better with somebody else, and I found ourselves with a management team and maybe an execution profile, which is not exactly what you want. And, and that's been turned around. I mean, so we are mm -hmm. today uh, a company that's addressed all those three issues. We've got financial strength back and we've addressed the bad assets and we're working through them. Uh, we've got a clear strategy and we've got a great management team that's executing correctly. But the most important thing, I guess, to keep in mind, we're a 200-year-old company. By the way, in 2012, we'll be exactly 200 years old and we'll start our third century. Uh, and we've gotten here because a lot of wonderful decisions made by a lot of CEOs over the last 200 years. Uh, and it is that franchise, that infrastructure, that footprint that actually allowed me to think about how to restructure a city, and you've really got to take your hats off to all the people who've run city over the last so many years to at least be, to get us to a point where we can withstand the kind of losses we've taken and at the same time uh, uh, to have the choices and the opportunities to restructure the company to where the world is going. Uh, I mean, you're clearly not at, uh, going in the direction of a financial supermarket model. In fact, you're going much more in the direction of kind of a more core traditional banking models. I mean, and there's been a lot of criticism of the notion that you could bring a lot of businesses together and uh, people would like the one-stop shopping aspect of it. They'd be mutually supporting, whether it was insurance or banking or investment banking. Um, and that was the direction that the company seemed to be going in, and you seem to have shifted it rather dramatically. Is that a correct uh, assessment? We are going back to our roots. That's really important. We're going back to our roots as a global bank for consumers and businesses. Uh, and you know, you got to start yourself by saying, what are you really good at? It's like DNA, individual DNA. What am I really good at? It's, uh, 
you know, Michael Jordan's really good at playing basketball, but he thought he'd try baseball and went back to basketball. It's mm -hmm. something about you know, what are you born with? What is it that makes you tick? In our case, uh, it's really about the fact that we are in 109 countries and we knit the world together. And, uh, and so uh, because of that knitting, we can offer a set of services, treasury, cash management, loans, things of that sort to our clients around the world like nobody else can. And that differentiates us, so much so that when I talk to the CEO of Pepsi, she tells me, you know what, we really cannot live without city because we're in a lot of different countries. You're the only ones who can serve us. And I hear the same thing from uh, Muttar Kent, who is the uh, mm -hmm. CEO of Coca-Cola. And you know, I often say to our people, it um, doesn't matter whether you like Coke or Pepsi, it's still city inside. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but, but that's where it starts. What we're really good at is that. And you take that and you figure out what's the smallest entity around that core DNA that you have that makes you a successful, profitable company that can serve clients well, that can grow well, et cetera. And that, ironically, is not all uh, sort of the old city or not all the new city. It's pieces of it pulled together. It's the cash management services business. It's the corporate bank. It's the investment bank. Um, it's our trading businesses, and it's our retail commercial banking businesses. When you put it all together, uh, it does look like we're returning to our roots as being really a bank at, mm -hmm. at, at, at the core, mm -hmm. um, a bank that is going to be less capital intensive, completely focused on the clients, and bank, I'll guarantee you, will practice responsible finance, and a bank where the management will be accountable for what they do. So you're in the process of, you know, you put assets into city holdings, you've got uh, Citicorp, you, what you're imagining in the future um, is you'll work out the, the toxic asset problems, you'll manage to, to deal with those issues, and you'll focus um, on this core banking function, and how many years from now will you be that bank that you want to be? Oh, I, first of all, the assets in city holdings, I wouldn't call them toxic. Right. As a matter some of fact, of, some of them are. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, there are many assets in there that are fabulous assets, like Primerica and City Financial and things of that sort. They wouldn't be in anybody's bad bank uh -huh. or anybody's toxic pile. They just happen to be businesses that we don't think are ours, and they should have a home somewhere else. And so far, we've sold, I think, something like 30 businesses in the last 18 months, and we've got another list of many to go, and we're selling them out. As, as well as we can, and we're down, I think we sold down about 300 billion of assets in this pool, and we'll probably make a substantial dent between now and the end of the year, so much so that, uh, that the core strategy of Citi, which is this global bank for consumers and businesses, will start shining through. That's the plan yeah. right now. And again, we're executing right on time, right on, right on the money, and the one thing that I'm most proud of is for a company that did not have a reputation for being able to execute over the last month, last 18 months, we've met every target, every target on mm -hmm. time and really on target for what we wanted to hit. Let me get to some audience questions. There are a whole bunch of them. Um, the federal debt continues to rise. Do you see the value of the dollar declining? And if so, what do you see as the safest place to put your cash and over the next decade <coughs> as well? City. <laughs> Would you like to elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think we are as a country taking a, lot, a huge debt burden. So is the UK, so is Spain, so are a lot of the Western European countries. They are taking on a debt burden and it's a substantial uh, issue for us. We're all gonna have to pay it down uh, over time. Um, and uh, the question is how? It really is about how and how is that gonna happen? Uh, there are two ways to pay down debt, and you know, any time you look at a company that's taken on too much debt, you say, well, what does the company do with it? Well, you get either really more efficient somehow, or it can start growing or grow its way out of it. Now, when the government takes on debt, don't look to them for efficiency. You gotta look to them of saying, okay, what are you gonna do? How are we gonna grow our way out of it? Um, and so some of those things we still need to work on as a country. We don't know exactly how that's going to grow. There's another way of paying down the debt, which is increasing taxes, but I'm not so sure that fits in with the principle of growing <laughs> the economy either. So there's, there, we have a lot of decisions yet to make, and we don't know exactly how this is going to unfold, um, but I do uh, believe that uh, the primary 
uh, economic forces that we look at around the world are those that surround the emerging markets. They're going to grow mm -hmm. over time. They have a development model that prompts growth. We have our own imbalance issues that's going to unfortunately probably result in lower or, or much lower or sort of stable economy with low growth per se. But as those economies rise, their currencies are going to get stronger. It happens mm -hmm. inevitably. And as mm -hmm. that happens, the, on a relative basis, the dollar is going to look cheaper. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the course that we're on. Um, but again, I don't think any one of us knows enough yet about how the debt's going to get paid down, how all the stimulus that's going to be, that's been put in to the economy gets wound down over time as the economy starts growing. We don't know enough to say exactly where these things are going, which is why volatility levels are still high in the market. Mm -hmm. Speaking of emerging markets, is there an emerging market or two that's a little non-obvious that you're very excited about, that its city is? Um, well, they're also interrelated. I mean, it really is very interesting to watch. Obviously, there are certain markets um, like India, which has so much domestic consumption that's sort of a mm -hmm. standalone economy that can work on its own. But there are even markets like Brazil, they need commodity prices to do well in order for the economy to do well. So a lot of these markets are so interconnected. And by the way, I'm not the first one to notice that there's something different going on in the emerging markets. Uh, the world seems to have noticed yeah. this, just witness where the index uh, levels are, sure. where the stock prices are, and all that in these markets as well. Um, the question to me is a different one, and this is not a short term, this is a very long term question. Um, given the development cycle we're seeing in the emerging markets, and the, given the demand for resources that implies, how can Africa be that far behind? Is mm -hmm. that economically possible? Mm -hmm. okay. So if you really believe in the emerging market story, mm -hmm. then you're going to believe in a development cycle in Africa. Right. Uh, and, and again, as I said, that's not a one-year, two-year, yeah. a three-year cycle, but, but neither were the emerging markets. And people talked about emerging markets since the uh, early 90s and late 80s, yeah. and it took a while for them to take off. So we're really intrigued with what's going on in Africa, South Africa, Northern Africa, mm -hmm. even Western Africa. There's a lot of interesting activity. Yeah. The, the Brazilians are investing there, building infrastructure. I know the Chinese are there, yeah. the Indians are there. Um, and there's something going on in there, and I'd watch it. I think it's one of those things that's gonna be great for everybody. This is, if there is one, it's a win, win, win. Mm -hmm. Uh, all through if we can get this development cycle in the emerging markets feeding its way through Africa. Great. Um, regarding the mass layoffs on Wall Street, have businesses stabilized and what's your outlook on hiring? So we had 375,000 people when I came in. We have right now about 275, maybe 279,000 people. So we're down a substantial amount. Um, we uh, feel we're in pretty good shape in terms of the people that we have. When you look at the activity levels out there, um, uh, we are uh, very keen to hire people from school. And by the way, we did that all the way through here. Did not miss a beat on hiring from undergraduate schools or business schools here and around the world. So that hiring is definitely going to continue unabated, and we happen to be, by the way, in a great place because we're in 109 countries. We can hire from the best schools around the world, and so mm -hmm. six and a half billion people to choose from in some ways. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but in some of our other businesses, we are hiring. You know, we just, um, because of everything that's going on through mortgages and credit cards and people need help on all of that, we just hired 5,000 people to help us in that particular process as an example. And so um, there is I think, as the question was asked, exactly the way it is, which is say, I think you've seen a lot of the initial resizing occur. There's a lot of re-engineering we need to do, that's for sure, and so that may result in some changes. But by and large, um, I feel pretty good about um, uh, the underlying growth rates of our business, and I would be surprised if we add a few more people over time. A okay. uh, question on structured finance and securitization. Do you think they'll ever return to 2005 levels? Um, and at what point did things go wrong? That's a hard question. Let's, uh, let's think about that uh, for a second. Um, 
for securitizations to return. Now think about how securitizations work. You took a pool of assets, put them in a place, and you created tranches of securities against them, the highest one being AAA and the lowest one being equity, per se. And there were a lot of things in this little pool, very complicated, a lot of things many people didn't understand. And ultimately, the way they got comfortable with it is because the rating agencies said that was a AAA. Okay, so the question is that if you cannot rely on the rating agencies, and I'm not saying you cannot, but suppose you stipulate that you cannot rely on a rating agency, are you gonna be able to do the work to understand what's in there to say whether this is a AAA or not? That's really difficult. Another way of saying that is that the volume of activity that can be supported by investors doing their own work to figure out whether these things are credit worthy or not is gonna be far smaller than the volume generated when they relied on the rating agencies to tell you that oh, this is a good security. Now, I happen to believe that, that the rating agencies are moving fast and in many ways, post the crisis, they're probably the best place to rate the securities now, given what they've learned through. But that's the conundrum. The conundrum is you cannot sell those securitized uh, bundles or securities without this element of trust or without this element of somebody saying money good, et cetera, and we don't know what the mechanism is for that to happen. There is one mechanism, which is to say that if you have $100 of securities, uh, you put in 90 cents of equity and 10 cents is debt, but at that point, why do it, right? right? You might as well own it on your balance sheet. And so there's a real market structure issue, a real conundrum as to how this market results in any size, and that's at the heart of the shadow banking system, which is one of the reasons why you're not seeing credit flowing. Okay. So too long an explanation. No, that's good. It's, it's important. interesting. Um, two more questions, and I think we're out of time. Uh, what's your assessment of the risk in the bank's commercial real estate loans? And obviously, commercial real estate is something that a lot of people think is an overhang that's going to slow down a recovery. Well, I got to tell you, I, um, you know, we, how should I say this very carefully? Um, what the heck? Let me see. Just we found every pothole along the way. I don't think we stepped into this one <laughs> the way every the way uh, that that some others might have. And so um, yes, we do have exposure to commercial real estate, but it's a very different kind of exposure. We have um, you know a lot of we don't have the the strip malls or construction loans that many other banks have in size. Uh, you know, we have some activities that are really very small in the context of what we do. We have some uh, uh, urban office real estate buildings, but they've been underwritten in a very different standard. Plus, by the way, there are, you know, leases there, rents there, et cetera. So both quality and quantity of our exposure in the commercial real estate area is very different. Now, uh, you know, uh, you don't have to believe me or, or, or just listen to me, all you gotta do is go to the stress test that was conducted mm -hmm. by the Fed and go through that and they looked at everybody's CRE exposure and corporate exposure and they ranked them. And so who's got the biggest exposure, who's got the smallest exposure, you'll, you'll, you'll see if you look at those numbers, we look pretty good in those. And another way of saying that is we're much, much, we're more underweight that, that cycle. Yeah. Uh, and frankly, you know, our, our consumer, uh, exposures were in, in line with the other major banks. Where we really went wrong was the first stage of the credit crisis, the mark-to-market -market credit crisis, right. where we had these subprime super senior loans where we took huge hits yeah. on that uh, last year. So uh, again, but th that's, that's the right question to ask because that's the third and the last stage of the credit crisis, most likely to occur next year. But I, fully, I, I believe that most of that is very well discounted in the stock prices and the markets around, uh, not only us, but everybody yeah. else. No surprises there, you think? Yeah. Well, I, I can't right. tell. I mean, how, <laughs> I, I, you don't know if it's a surprise yeah, until yeah, you, unless, unless it, happens. it happens. So right. I'm not expecting a surprise, right. but yeah. I've been wrong. Okay. Before. All right. Uh, final question. This is an audience question. It probably would have been my last question anyway. Uh, what should bankers have learned from this crisis, and have they? Here's the thing, um, you have a lot of smart people in the markets, and these are very qualified, thoughtful people. We have a lot of smart investors. Um, one of them introduced uh, Steve this, uh, this evening as well, and um, 
Uh, you know, we have regulators, we have agencies, and we have a huge infrastructure of monitoring what's going on. And you have um, the general philosophy that we have all come to uh, accept, which is, you know what, leave it up to the markets, they handle these things. The real question that is sort of the heart of these issues on regulation or market structure or systemic regulator, things. how did the capital markets miss this? How did they miss it? Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, you know, by the way, in any crisis, there is always an 80-20 rule, 20% 20 of the people get it right. When they get it right, people think they're smart, sometimes they're lucky, but it doesn't matter. But there are 80% of the people who are on the other side. The question really is, that what is it about the market structure? And what is it about efficient markets or rational thinking? And what is it about regulation or whatever? How could the markets have missed this? Um, now, by the way, the, I, I talk about this often with a number of different people. Some of them say to me, well, you know, it's interesting because the markets are actually working a lot better. And w what that means is the markets can see the five-year flood. They can see the 10-year flood. They can see the 20-year flood. They can see the 50-year flood. It handles it. But when it doesn't see something, that becomes a 100-year flood by definition in some ways. And so uh, the questions uh, for bankers and economists and financial markets participants is that is g getting back again to what, it is, what is it about markets and their structure and that regulation that did not allow us to see this thing coming and the real, uh, the real sort of issues that come out of this um, relate, uh, relate to uh, economic principles of efficiency, principles of regulation, et cetera. And so what I think we have all learned on this, from this is this new area called behavioral economics, behavioral finance, or areas that talk about, or Schiller talks about these animal spirits, or group behavior, or, uh, or the fact that, uh, that not every part of the markets are always rational are something that we're going to have to deal with uh, on a real life basis, on a continuing basis. And we're dealing through that, and we're thinking about that very carefully as well, and I think all the regulators are as well. Okay, I didn't learn much about your childhood, but we learned about many other things. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, Vikram Pandit. Steve, thank you.